Welcome to Agronomy ALM 110. This subject is part of the agricultural degree offered at NMIT. For further information about the subjects offered at NMIT, please refer to the website. This is Lecture 2, an introduction to agronomy and climate. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In today's lecture, I'm going to introduce the subject of agronomy. We're going to outline the basic inputs for plant growth and talk extensively about one of those important inputs, the role of Australian climate on Australian agronomy. Agronomy is derived from the Greek words agros, meaning field, and nomos, meaning manage. Agronomy is a branch of agricultural science which deals with the principles and the practices of soil, water and crop management. A science that implements the crop environment complex with dual aims of improving productivity and gaining a degree of understanding of the principles involved. This was defined by Norman in 1980. The definition I wish to use for this subject is that agronomy is the successful, sustainable, profitable, neutrally secured, efficient crop production with least or no environmental degradation. Agronomy deals with the methods which provide favourable environmental to higher crop productivity. Agronomy can be thought of and defined as an art. It is also possible to use scientific principles to make improvements in agronomy. In this subject we will employ scientific principles to describe the discipline of agronomy. As well as underpinning the concepts of science with agronomy, we are also going to examine agronomy from a commercial aspect and not from a growing plants to feed a population. You may think this is a bit strange, but the consequences of the commercialisation of this industry are greatly impacting on the management practices. For example, if you are a farmer growing wheat and you measure soil nutrients finding low zinc concentration at growing stage 45, you will assess both the economic and the plant health consequences of adding the soil nutrient that it's deficient in and not doing anything at all. Depending on the outcome of your estimations, you may decide that the best action is to do nothing. So let us start from first principles. How do you grow a crop? In order to cover these, we must look at the basic principles that underpin plant growth. Here is a list of the basic requirements or inputs. You will see that climate, soil, topography, the use, plant type, plant traits and legal aspects are all important inputs. Throughout this subject we will examine many of these inputs in such detail. For the time being and the rest of this lecture I'd like to concentrate on the input of climate. Climate has significant effects on plant growth and as such is an important input and must be understood thoroughly. In the next part of the lecture we will explore the science of climate. The first thing we need to understand is that there is a difference between weather and climate and that difference is a measure of time as stated by NASA. Weather is what conditions of the atmosphere are over a short period of time and climate is how the atmosphere behaves over a relatively long period of time. When we talk about climate change we talk about changes in long-term averages of daily weather. How many times have you heard from a parent, grandparent, friend, neighbour, stranger in the street? The weather was different when I was at school. When I first moved to Australia, I remember hearing many stories of how the weather was different from the older population who lived in the areas of Mildura. They were particularly noting how rainfall patterns had changed and how this had changed the Murray River. Well, this would suggest a change or evolving climate. These differences are important when growing plants as plants respond to both short-term growing conditions, for example hot spell, 
and to long-term weather conditions, the effect on growth and development of accumulative weather inputs. Let us now become uh, familiar with the way climate data is presented and learn about Australia's climate distribution. We will explore temperature, frost, snow, rainfall, humidity, hail, wind and sunlight. All of the weather data we shall discuss in this lecture are from the Bureau of Meteorology or BOM for, sure, for short. This is an excellent resource for agronomy and one I would encourage you to become familiar with. The figure that you see on the slide shows a map of Australia. It is the temperature distribution of Australia. The first thing to note that different cover colours represent different temperatures. The lighter and darker blue colours are cool mean daily temperatures, while the pinks and reds are hotter mean daily temperatures. Daily temperature in both agronomy and in climate science is usually referred to in the units of degree C. You will notice the large range of climates in Australia. This is predominantly due to the large geographical size of Australia. The largest part of Australia is desert or semi-arid areas where commercial agronomy is not typically practiced. The southeast and southwest corners have a temperate climate and moderately fertile soil and where much of agronomy can be found. The northern part of the country has a tropical climate, varied between tropical rainforest, grasslands and part desert, and some tropical crops are grown there. So let us talk about how temperature and cropping interact. You can think of optimal ambient growing temperatures as the ideal temperatures that a plant grows at. The optimal temperature will not inhibit any other aspect of plant growth or development. <coughs> For many temperate crops, the optimal temperature is around 25 degrees C. When ambient temperature signific significantly deviates from the optimal growing temperature, the corresponding impact will depend on both the direction of the response, that is, is the temperature hotter or colder, and the magnitude of response, and by that we mean how many degrees above or below the ideal temperature. To determine this optimal temperature, temperature response curves have been produced. These have been produced during controlled environmental experimentation. That is, that no other component or input of the crop is limited, and often this experimentation occurs in growing rooms but it can also occur in the field with lots of analysis to accompany the growing and the determination of the impact. So let us have a look at a typical temperature response curve. The figure on your screen shows the temperature response curve for a maize crop. On the y-axis is the relative rates of growth and on the x-axis is the temperature and you will see the temperature in this experimentation ranges from 0 to about 41 degrees. This top temperature is often referred to as temperature max or for short T max. The symbols on the graph which range from circles, open triangles and closed triangles and crosses represent a suite of scientific peer-reviewed experimentation. The results from these experiments have been plotted and the line in that follows these experiments has been mathematically determined based on modelling. This can show you that the curve or response is similar but not exactly a bell shape. In fact, it's slightly skewed to the right. Please note, when conducting these experiments, all other inputs were not limiting. That means that things like water and nutrients,
carbon dioxide were not limited. It also means that the assumption is that the crop is healthy and not suffering from any disease or insect attacks. This is described as the reductionist approach, meaning that you are only changing one parameter at any one given time. These are fundamental principles that the scientific research stands upon. This particular response curve for maize is demonstrating that the optimal temperature for growing this variety of maize is at 31 degrees C. T-opt is the abbreviation for optimal temperature. This number was determined as it, it is represented on the graph as the top of the graph. If you move to the left hand side, you will see that the response is different to the right hand side, i.e. if you go hotter than the optimal temperature, the response is different than if you go cooler from the optimal temperature. The understanding of how the curve is different if you are cooler than the optimal temperature or hotter than the optimal temperature is very important. If you note from our climate lecture in lecture two, the Australian climate tends to have high ambient temperatures with low rainfall in many crop growing regions. Therefore, this is very important. If you were to exceed 42 degrees, this means that there would be significant economic loss and probably crop degradation. Therefore, if you are growing in a region where you are subjected to many 40 degree days, then you would think very carefully and perhaps not select this variety of maize or this species to grow in that area. If, however, you were growing your maize in a cooler area, a more temperate region, and your average temperature was between 25 and 30, this would not have signif as significant inputs as, or, or, or significant loss in commodity as would a higher temperature. The formula on the left hand side for your information is the formula they use to derive the curve. You will not have to learn this formula, it is there just for interest only. Please note that plants will respond to both the mean temperature and the temperature variability. This was stated in the paper in 1995 by Samonvi and Porter. High temperature episodes have a major effect on yield, especially when coinciding with flowering, as stated by Wheeler et al. in 2000. Whereas increases in mean temperature have an effect on the crop duration, as stated by Squire 1990s and Nigram et al. in 1994. So therefore, in summary, temperature can increase or decrease yield. It depends on the optimal and versus the ambient temperature relationship. Australia's climate is ruled by the hot, sinking air of the subtropical high pressure belt, which moves north and south within seasons. This causes the rainfall pattern over Australia to be highly seasonal. Australia's rainfall is the lowest of the seven continents, besides Antarctica. Rainfall is variable with frequent droughts lasting several seasons and is thought to be caused in part by the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Since it is a small continent separated from polar regions by the Southern Ocean, Australia does not get the harsh snaps of the polar air that swarm over Northern Hemisphere continents during winter. The continents in the Norman, Nor Northern Hemisphere have a considerable temperature contrast between summer and winter, whereas in Australia the temperature contrast is small. We have talked about the variation in rain and the variation in temperature across Australia. 
This leads into the concept of seasonality. Seasonality is really the amalgamation of all of those aspects which create a climate and their cyclic fluctuations which occur during the year. In some areas of Australia the Aboriginals had six seasons. These were the wet, the dry season, summer, autumn, winter and spring. The Bureau of Meteorology has characterised major seasonal rainfall zones for Australia. You can see that many different types of zones exist. That is from a temperate climate through to a more marked hotter and drier climate. Each colour represents a different climate class and these classes are defined on the right hand side of the image. This figure on the slide, also produced by the Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology, defines the climatic classes by rainfall in millimetres. Again, the colours associated with the amount of rainfall these areas on average receive. You will notice from the variation in colour, again, that Australia is subjected to great seasonal rainfall. The image on the slide, produced by the Bureau of Meteorology, demonstrates the days of rain per annum on average for Australia. As you can see, there are large variations, ranging from no rain all the way through to 175 days of rain. The graph on your screen now illustrates the rainfall distribution across a year for four major cities, Hobart, Darwin, Mer Melbourne and Perth. You will note that Melbourne and Hobart have reasonably steady rainfall throughout the year. Darwin in the far north has a lot of rainfall from November to March, followed by a very dry period from May to September, while Perth follows a different pattern again. This figure shows great variation in rainfall distribution across Australia. If rainfall in a particular area is above an optimum, it is not the amount of rain that is important, but many farmers will argue the reliability of that rain. This is an important agronomical input and therefore consideration when choosing an area to grow a crop and the type of crop that should be planted. The index of variability is a mathematical relationship which allows an, estimate, an assessment of rainfall and its reliability. The lower the value, the more reliable the rainfall. The index of variability is equal to the 90th percentile rainfall minus the 10 percentile rainfall divided by the 50th percentile rainfall values for a given area over a given time. The Bureau of Meteorology applied the formula of index variability and produced the annual rainfall variability percentile analysis, the figure demonstrated on your screen. As you can see from this figure, there are only a few areas around Australia that receive reliable rainfall. The central areas have very high variable indices and therefore do not get reliable rainfall. The following table contains data from the Bureau of Meteorology based at Seymour, a farming town that is a one hour drive north of Melbourne off the Hume Highway. The annual percentile analysis table was compiled by the Bureau of Meteorology for Seymour. This data can be requested from this department and will be emailed to you as a spreadsheet and looks like the spreadsheet on the screen. Let us calculate the index of variability for Seymour. Please note that the medium rainfall statistic represents the 50 percentile rainfall. To calculate the index of variability for Seymour, you will need to consider a few facts. Use the formula on the screen, index of variability equals 90th percentile minus 10th percentile. You take that value and then divide it by the 50th percentile. Secondly, we use the annual data points provided and not the monthly data for this calculation. 
Thirdly, select the data points that you need to calculate the index. You can stop the lecture now and consider which points these might be. Please bring your calculated value to the first practical, that is the first day of teaching at Yang Ying, so we can discuss this value. The data on the screen was obtained by the FAO Irrigation and Drainage Paper 66, Crop Yield Responses to Water. While it may look very complicated, the take-home message is relatively simple that different growth stages require different amounts of water. And if you impact on different growth stages, you will have different impacts on yield. So that means depending on what stage of the life cycle, life cycle a crop is at, it will depend on the impact of the water deficit. The figure on the slide demonstrates this. Each line represents a linear water production function. That is, it describes the relationship of water deficit as a different key developmental period. The slope represents mathematical relationships. The mathematical relationship suggests that the response to water is a linear one. You need to understand that the steeper the slope, the greater the reduction to yield. Once you understand the relationship between the steepness of the slope, you will understand the take-home messages of this slide. In summary, flowering is very sensitive while ripening is not as sensitive. If you wish to, you can make a list starting from least sensitive to most sensitive based on the figure on this slide. So now we have um, explored rain, rainfall, rainfall variability, rainfall seasonality, and annual percentile. What do we need to know about water and cropping? If a crop is limited in the amount of water that is available, it is defined as water stress. This may also be described as drought stress. If a crop has too much water, this can result on negative impacts on yield. The excessive amount of water can cause anaerobic conditions in the soil, or too much water can wash away nutrients and soil structure. Both of these impede negatively on yield. If a crop does not have access to the correct volume of water it requires for growth and productivity, it will be negatively impacted. The amount of rainfall and water available in the soil equals the amount of water available to the crop. Humidity can also impact on this relationship. If you have ever left a tropical plant outside in the winter on a cold frosty morning, you will see the significant damage that this climate input can have in a relatively short amount of time. The Bureau of Meteorology calculates frost as the potential frost days. The image on the screen shows you the huge distribution of potential frost days, with the highest occurrence occurring in the, the east and southeast of Australia. Frost usually occurs on clear nights in early spring when the air temperature drops to 2 degrees or less. Damage to crops from frost may occur at any stage of development, but it is most damaging if it occurs around the flowering stage. As stated, frost can occur any time during the season and cause damage. When it occurs at flowering, it results in significant damage and can result in loss in productivity. Stem damage is commonly seen with frost damage. The mode of action for frost damage is usually ice can form inside the plant tissue. As the temperature after the frost rises, this ice will expand and it results in mechanical damage and dehydration inju injury, which will then result in physical damage to the plant, loss of cells. Frost damage can reduce both grain yield and quality. 
In 2008, extreme frosts in September in, in Western Australia were seen, and these were estimated by Garen Knell, a consultant in agriculture, to cost Western Australia up to $105 million in potential net farm income. Therefore, you can see firsthand the severity of this particular climate input. Frost risk minimization is a strategy that can be employed to reduce the risk of frost. Costs are often associated with conservative management to minimize frost risk. These can include a delayed sowing and its associated yield reduction, sowing less profitable crops such as barley and oats, avoiding cropping on the valley floors which also contain some of the most productive parts of the landscape. Much of this frost risk minimization requires knowledge of the area and the types of frost that are most prevalent. There are two types of frost that occur. Different conditions under which the frost occurs will influence what management practices will be more effective. These also include delay flowering, avoid high inputs, sow more frost to tolerant crops and pastures, grow hay, avoid sowing susceptible crops in frost prone areas such as low lying areas, sow and graze dual purpose crops, encourage cool air drainage. This requires a, a specialised consultant. Clay sandy surface paddocks, ensure crops have an adequate supply of trace elements and macronutrients. Crop deficient or marginal in potassium and copper are more likely to be susceptible to frost damage and this may also be the cause for molybdenum, another micronutrient. If your crop experienced a frost event, there are a number of strategies after the frost event that you can implement. These are known collectively as post-frost management. You can harvest as usual and just wear the reduction in the yield. Hay and silage, you can chain and rake, you can graze, spray, cultivate, swathe and burn. You will be given a tutorial to accompany this lecture called Frost and Crops. In this tutorial you will be given an exercise about the subtopic of frost and agronomy. Please note that the information that you gain from this tutorial will complete these lecture notes. So when both you are revising for this lecture and compiling your lecture notes, please sure, ensure that you insert your frost and crops tutorial information in this section here. Evaporation is the amount of water which ex ev ev evaporates from an open pan called a Class A evaporative pan. The rate of evaporation depends on factors such as cloudiness, air temperature and wind speed. Measurements are made by the addition of subtraction of a known amount of water, which then tells us how much water has been evaporated from the pan. The figure on the slide from the FAO Chapter 3 Crop Water Needs summarises this relationship. Average pan evaporation has been calculated by the Bureau of Meteorology for Australia. Different colours relate to different total evaporate, evaporation. The unit recorded is in millimetres. As you can see from the colour variation, there is considerable change or variation in pan evaporation across Australia. This is another climate input that needs to be considered when growing crops, as it has physiological effects on both crop growth and productivity. The lowest pan evaporation occurs around the south and southeast, while the centre and the northeast have higher total pan evaporation. Next time you're stood outside on a windy day, you may take a few minutes to realise how difficult it is to measure wind direction as it is often changing. The difficulties in this measurement are also reflected in the difficulties of representing this kind of data. The wind rose is a time-honoured method of graphically presenting the wind conditions 
the wind direction and speed over a period of time at specific locations. Again, the Bureau of Meteorology have produced maps that illustrate differences. We will look at a map both in the morning and in the afternoon. Wind can impact crops in two major ways. It can change the leaf boundary layer environment, which has an impact on transpiration, the loss of water through plants, pores called stomate. It can influence water loss. Secondly, wind can result in damage to crop growth, reduce cell division and cell elongation. This can reduce plant height and leaf area, and some instances can completely destroy your crop. You will see from exam examining the wind roses across different areas of Australia that there is much variation in this climate input. The image on the slide now illustrates afternoon wind in the summer months. You can pause the lecture here and see if you can identify which areas in Australia have different morning and afternoon wind observations. You should also be able to identify areas with relatively high winds and areas with where wind is not such a consideration. The number of hours that the sun shines across a day is easily calculated and the Bureau of Meteorology have produced a map and illustrated differences across Australia. The colours on the map represent the number of hours. The yellow colour is the highest number of hours, while the purple, deep purple colour not represented on the image but on the key, shows very few hours. You will note that there is some variation in daily sunshine hours across Australia, with the areas around Perth having the most sunshine. Too much light can damage plants via the mechanism called photorespiration. Not enough plants can reduce production and yield. So why is sunshine so important for crop growth? The graph here summarises the relationship between photosynthesis, which we will discuss in detail in Lecture 4, which for the purposes here you can think of as the energy production, to light levels. Light levels are on the x-axis and the abbreviation for the measurement is PPFD and this is measured in a unit called micromoles per metre squared per second. In summary, that unit is the amount of energy, the micromoles, over an area, the metre squared, over time, a second. The uh, photosynthetic rate is also commonly in the literature called assimilation rate. And this is also measured in the amount of energy, micromoles, over an area, metre squared, per, over time, per second. This relationship on the graph is stating that as light levels increase, so does assimilation rate. Therefore, the more light, the more growth. This is true most of the time. However, there are some situations where too much light can become a stress, particularly when ambient temperatures are above optimal temperatures or when the plant is significantly water stressed. When you start to sum some of the climatic data, you can create what is called climate zones. The Bureau of Meteorology has produced a climate zone indicating changes in temperature and humidity for Australia. This is a, si a simple and very significant concept. We can begin to class Australia, areas of Australia, into these climatic zones and think about how they impact on agronomy. As you can see from the illustration on the slide, the north areas of Australia tend to be hot and humid, while the lower areas or the more southern areas, particularly down in Hobart, are more temperate and cooler. There are other systems of classification worth noting.
and we will explore some of these now. Windermere Peter Koopen was a German scientist who studied in the area of geography, climate and was also a botanist. He had an interesting career which gave him many of these skill sets. He completed his PhD on the effects of temperature on plant growth at the University of Zibig in 1870. In 1884, he published his first system of climax cl uh, classification, which can be seen on the slide. The Keopen system of climate classification is based on the concept that native vegetation is the best expression of climate. Hence, climate zones boundaries have been selected with vegetation distribution in mind. It combines average annual and monthly temperatures with annual precipitation and with seasonal precipitation. Here is a later published map based on Coprin's classification and modified on major classification groups. Australia's climate, as you can see, ranges from temperate, which is ideal for growing many C3 crops, through to tropical and equatorial, more suited for some C4 and CAM plants. These plants exhibit specialisations to these habitats. The variation in climate that we have discussed proven previously in this lecture is reflected by the huge variation in native vegetation. Here we can examine Copland's modified system in more detail. The right hand axis gives more detail about the different climate classifications and subclassifications within each classification. The final map that you have seen based on the modified Copland system is the most recent published by the Bureau of Meteorology in 2013. You will note more detail and a higher resolution is shown in this image than the previous images. Depending on where your farm or your farming enterprise is based, you can use the information on this map to select your crops for the most optimal crop yield and production. For example, if you have a crop like wheat, it may be more suited to a temperate environment than an equatorial environment. To complete this lecture, I'd like you to refer to the following Bureau of Meteorology website on the Australian climate. You will see attached to the topic in this area a list of questions. Please read the Bureau of Meteorology website and then answer the questions. This will give you additional detail on the Australian climate and if learnt will enable you to describe the Australian climate for agronomy purposes very well. At the end of this lecture, you should compile a summary of the most important concepts delivered in the lecture. In this lecture, some of the important concepts I consider important are that you understand that Australia has a varied climate and this includes all components of that climate from temperature, humidity, light, wind and frost. This climate is described very accurately by the, the, the Bureau of Meteorology and throughout this lecture you have seen maps which enable you to describe all of these climate inputs. These climate inputs can impact both positively and negatively on growth and crop development of plants. It is important that you understand the concept of seasonality, particularly as the Australian climate and environment is very susceptible to seasonality. This can have significant impacts in agronomy and agronomy management. Index of variability is a concept that we have dealt with and is a, rainfall, is, is a measure of rainfall reliability. Any deviation from the optimal climate inputs, either temperature, water, availability, sunlight, wind and humidity, can result in reduced yield and quality. 
The timing, that is the duration, intensity and frequency and phenological stage of the climatic stress can result in different effects. And you've been shown examples of how different stresses on different phenological stages can impact. And finally, climate maps have been developed based on native vegetation, which are a very good source in order to estimate what crops would be best to grow in your region and what crops to stay away from. There are many considerations with respect to climate and it is important that you familiarise yourself with climate, with the measurement of climate, with its inputs and how it affects both your commodity and your physiology of your crop. This is the end of lecture two.